Welcome to the Tiger Performance Podcast, where we feature high achieving entrepreneurs and coaches and share their performance journeys. Now, let's get started with the show. Steve Adams here, founder and CEO of Tiger Medical Institute. I'm the host of the Tiger Performance Podcast, where I interview thought leaders about their unique stories and specialized knowledge they can offer the world. It's time to now to acknowledge our sponsor for today's episode, which is the Tiger Medical Institute. Our focus is on the mid-career C-suite executive, entrepreneur, and dental professional, many of whom are depleted and not showing up as the best version of themselves. The Tiger system is a personalized root cause approach to health optimization. Our system is a one-year health transformation journey, empowering you so you can show up as the best and healthiest version of you. Visit us at TigerMI.com today to learn more. Well, today we have a very interesting guest, Dr. Paul Goodman. And Dr. Goodman is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Goodman has been practicing dentistry for over a decade, works with his brother in two locations in Mercer County, New Jersey. Dr. Goodman has purchased multiple dental practices and shares his personal experience with retiring dentists in managing the expectations of their patients and their team members during the transition process. He's also the founder of Rising Dentist Study Club and the Rittenhouse Consulting Company, both based in Philadelphia. Also, uh, Dental Job Connect. I think yeah. we just talked about that before. Uh, we'll get into all of that. And then while also, while chief uh, dental resident during his general practice residency and hospital uh, fellowship at Albert Einstein Medical Center, Dr. Goodman received advanced training and also placed and restored 150 dental implants. He's been a faculty member of the Hoisin Dental Implant Training Program for the past 10 years and has helped over 100 general dentists place their first dental implants. Additionally, finally, he teaches dental residents at Albert Einstein Medical Center, lecturing on placing and restoring implants. Dr. Goodman, it's a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Great to be here, Steve. Really excited. I like what you do here. Like the whole concept of total well health and wellness, so important and excited to chat. Yeah, great. Well, I like to start personal. So, um, well, tell me first. I mean, do you have a family? You want to talk about brag about that first? Yeah, yeah. Have, having a family is, you know, when they say you have, when they say you're going to have a child, people tell you it's the best thing ever. They just don't add in. It's the best and most exhausting thing ever. Yes. So I have an eight and a four year old that live in our house with my wife Mary and I. We have a, a golden doodle Tilly. We live in Center City, Philadelphia. I love city living. I was a suburb uh, kid and I, my practice is in the suburbs, my two dental practices, but I love living in Center City. And we like all the things the city has to offer from walkability, museums, great restaurants. I'm a huge fan of uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, me too. I've been there many times and up and down the main line. And yeah, uh, you know, obviously the historical stuff there with the Independence Hall and all of that. So yeah, it's a cool city and it's got attitude. If you're a sports fan, I have I don't know how coaches hold up in that city. Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they're, there's a lot of passion. If someone called yeah. it an obsession, that would be me. I'd call people obsessed. They're obsessed, passionately obsessed with yeah. Eagles, especially with the Eagles. Right. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, – so I, I I used to be from Michigan, so I'm a long-suffering Detroit Lions fan. And I think oh, gotcha. I played you guys first game of the season. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, I saw that a funny Lions thing where um, a meme or something that said, uh, we're proud that the quarterback used to play for us won a Super Bowl, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, hey, uh, so tell us a little bit. Are, are you from Philadelphia? I'm from the whole the area. I'm from central New Jersey area near Princeton. Our practices are in Pennington and Ewing, about 45 minutes from here. But okay. I've been in this area my whole life. But I, I was born in New Jersey. Okay. So what was it like growing up in your parents' household? Like, what, what did you take away from that that you can kind of point to today as kind of that was real formative for you? I, I would like to uh, I'd like to use a prop for your audience. I forgot I have it. Sure. I yeah. Uh, so I don't know if they can – this will be – I don't know if this will be a video, but I'm holding a basketball. So I would like to, I would like to rep, uh, share that this was my failed dream. I wanted to play in the NBA for the yep. Philadelphia 76ers. But when you grow to almost 5'10", you have to get different dreams. You yeah. know, so when your parents say all your dreams can come true, you know, that's not always true. So I say that jokingly that um, I grew up with the amazing parents. Unfortunately, both of them are not alive right now, but they're phenomenal. They were phenomenal parents. Yeah. Um, my I wanted to be a dentist, doctor, or lawyer. My dad was a dentist. He did not pressure me to become a dentist in any way. Uh -huh. I grew up in the practice, helping out. But, you know, he did say that being your own boss was something he really liked. He liked helping people. 
uh, it could, you know, was a financially rewarding career. I feel very lucky to how I grew up with a lot of yeah. opportunities. So I did the seven year dental program at Villanova and Penn Dental. Oh, uh, yeah. Dental school. I really, you know, the the academic aspect, it didn't come easy for me, but I was fairly strong in that. Some mm-hmm. of the arts and crafts aspect of dentistry was a struggle to me. So at some point I was like, I don't know if this is for me, dad, I'm not sure. Maybe I should do something that, you know, is really one of my strengths. And he said, you know, Paul, do whatever you want with your, your life. I support you, but you know, you, you wanted to be your own boss and I'm glad I stuck with it. I really found that dental implants was something I really loved. Sure. I'm not, I, I, I'm well, actually, that's artistry though. That's artistry. Yeah, you know, I think art, there's a great book my friend, Dr. Mitchell Rubinson gave me there called Steal Like an Artist, because it talks about how ideas get repurposed and things like that. You know, artistry can be a lot of different things. You know, I'm a fairly creative guy. I write a lot. But in terms of like a painting or a drawing or doing clay work, that is not my thing. And a lot of times dental school, the first two years is a lot about that, which does not always reflect how real dentistry is. Dental school has a lot of problems in teaching real world stuff. I always say that if dental school taught parenting classes, they would teach you how to knit your own onesies, even though you could buy them at the store, right? They would (laughs) have you read articles from parenting in the 1960s. And then you would say, what about learning how to feed the baby? They say, oh, you can learn that later. And I found that a lot of those schools just do not place the value on the real world survival skills you need. Yeah. Now they have a ton of, they have a difficult job, whether it's dental school, medical school, optometry school, but I, I really will share that I, I am concerned for the future of our profession and that they don't really embrace what is practical learning, you know? So yeah, I right. struggled with some of that, uh, but I love dental implants. I did my residency. I love that you can create something from scratch. I love you could give people their smile back. I do it, do it today. Talk to patients. I say, you're so lucky. You know, a lot of people see, which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. They place weird, they have dysfunctional ways in how they spend money, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'll have a 65-year-old. This is a true, just a true story. Okay. They have a house in New Jersey, New York, and Florida. Okay. Three houses. Okay. You got three houses. Mm-hmm. One body, three houses. Okay. Right. And I'll say, Hey Molly, hey Millie, you know, we need to replace these two teeth. They've lived a good long life. You eat a thousand meals a year. You've gotten 30,000 meals. The investment in doing this is going to be $11,000. And they react sometimes like I would call it with like emotional instability and be like, yeah. this is so crazy expensive. And sometimes I know them well enough because I'm kind of like a jokey person. I'm like, you know, you have three houses, right? I'm like, you don't need a third house. And they laugh a little bit. But I think that what's hard about dentistry, Stephen, I'm your other guest, said it is very difficult to be sitting six inches away from a customer yep. who does not want what you're selling. It's yeah. not a fun experience. No, it doesn't I, matter if you make seven figures. It doesn't matter if you have Wednesdays off. I just want to share that your patients, and I know dentists don't like patients to be called customers, but we're not funded by the government. These are private right, practices. They're your clients, man. Yeah. So our, our clients... You know, when you go to, we had a nutritionist in the beginning of this year who was a great guy. We were excited to talk to this nutritionist. He gave us programs. You know, I felt it was a great investment, what some people would call expensive. But when my wife and I would get his check-ins or or as if we were excited because we wanted to eat better, right? Right. You sign up to go to France. You are excited because you want to go to France, right? Right, yeah. But when you are a dentist, you got to embrace that you are selling pe- things that people don't want. And that can be emotionally exhausting preventative you know they don't have a bleeding juggler uh and it's not cheap and um it's it's incredible to me that you know a lot of the people that we work with they'll spend 20 30 thousand on a vacation you know first class tickets for four people plus everything uh and then they'll only want to do what insurance will pay and we'll talk about are you letting the insurance company decide what you're going to do with your one body you know, that's right. so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So I know that feeling. We have those challenges. I have this next to me. I say, I call dental insurance is like a coupon. If everyone called it just a coupon, these are like from the New Jersey bed, bath and beyonds. Uh, yeah. You know, it would be better, but dental insurances have created a lot of challenges for healthcare practitioners to do help patients do what's in their best interest. Right. I, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, uh, uh, you also, you're obviously creative because you have, you've got your study clubs that you started. You've got the, 
Dental Nachos, which is a training platform. And you've got Dental Connect, I believe. I'm trying to read it yeah. in the background. Dentist Job Connect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So have you found that being an entrepreneur is really maybe even more of what your calling is in addition to making people have a great smile? I think so. You know, I'm a big fan of this uh, guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he's like, you know, my age, I find him to be amazing. One of the, I was on his Tea with Gary V uh, show over the pandemic and he grew up in New Jersey. And I think when you are a child of the nineties in New Jersey, you think I'm going to be a doctor, dentist, or lawyer. Not many people think of doing other things. I also have some really smart business finance friends, right? Yeah. But my generation, it's not really a criticism, just more of awareness that sort of doing what your passion is was not really <laughs> totally embraced. It was sort of like, these are good careers, pick sure. a good career, right? Yeah. And he said that led to a lot of, un- has led to a lot of unhappiness for people. I am like, I have a lot of super strengths. I have a lot of super opportunities for improvement, what my wife calls weaknesses. So I have a lot of, su- I no, I have a lot of super opportunities for improvements, but I have a few super strengths. And one of my super strengths is mental flexibility mm-hmm. and kind of enjoy trying to find the best in things. So what you said was interesting. When I I have a business coach who was very lucky to meet Aldana Ambler. She's changed my life. Met her in 2018. Mm-hmm. I've met her as one of my coaches. I was I was not going to have, you know, when people say I'm going to have a nervous breakdown, it's it's kind of dramatic, right? I was going to have an exhaustion problem. I was selling practices, being a dentist, starting dental notches, and I needed her help. And I I remember yeah. our first call with her and she said, you don't want to stop any of this. You just needed two full-time teams members like six months ago, you can't do all this by yourself. And that one conversation, she's still my coach today. She's helped me build this. But when I met with her in person and she saw me, she's like, you could do this for any profession. You could do this for any industry. Dental nachos could be uh, accounting nachos or nurse nachos or teacher's nachos. This has to do with you who happens to be a dentist. So probably what you had said is my my most the thing I live for is helping, right? If it doesn't help, it doesn't matter is what I say, but then be proud to sell help, right? I'm not really running a nonprofit. I think nonprofits are great, but it's a true business, right? That strives to be profitable. But I, I think that um, my entrepreneurial nature, I always was like that as a kid. I look at into different things and I really, you know, dentistry is great. Some of the great parts about dentistry, if you talk to dentists, is also some of the poignant parts. And this is what I'll share. Dentists sometimes graduate from dental school, do a residency, work for two years. And then age 31, they're a practice owner. Yeah. And they're making excellent income and they're working four days a week. But dental hours are dog years hours. So there's no such thing as four yeah. days a week for them. Yeah. yeah. But age 31 and age 61 don't always look dramatically different in for how their life is. Yeah. And for some dental personalities, that is awesome, right? They crave stability, you know, build my practice up. To yeah. me, I like growing, scaling, changing new things. So when I joined my dad's practice, we added specialists. We bought another location. You know, um, I'm not I'm not very risky when it comes to personal things. Like, I don't need to skydive, Steve. Like, whoever, yeah, I know. whoever skydives, like, like, whatever's in someone's brain who is like, I want to skydive, I have the opposite thing in my brain, okay? Me too. Why do you want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? <laughs> <laughs> but probably with financial risk, I do a lot of financial risk things that are like skydiving that would make other people freak out. And I understand that, right? And I mean, Me too. I have like a tremendously high tolerance for financial risk and like thinking like, hey, I, I like doing this and I'll figure out how to land on my feet. You know, right. um. I had, you asked about my parents. I had the most amazing mom. She, you know, say, sadly she died when I was 20, but she really raised me to be like, uh, if I was a restaurant manager in Philadelphia, I could do that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I would make that work for my family, not, no judgment on it. So it's, I don't have this, like I, I buy practice, work in practice, retire from practice. To me, it's exciting to do other things, but it's also entrepreneurial things can be, incredibly intense i'll put in uh, towards yeah. for stress intense thing. yep well and i see i grew up in uh, mid michigan my dad worked at general motors you know that's what you do in michigan okay people build cars and um and so he worked 33 years same place his whole life and i got out of school and he's like and i went to a big bank called national bank of detroit which is now they merged with chase so they're part of chase and I was in the corporate lending area doing really well. And he was like, 
Now, see, you got the perfect gig. You can do this till you're 65. And I, I thought, I'm going to die if I do this till I'm 65. Right. And so I quit when I was 32. About the time you started your dental practice, I was on top of the world making great money. And I quit and I started, a, I bought into a pet franchise and I moved my wife and two-year-old and new baby to another state. And we started our first store. And uh, my dad just was like, you're crazy. You're doing this. And but it ended up turning out okay. It turned into a big 40 some store chain that I was able to sell five years ago and do pretty well from it. And, but it was that I wouldn't trade that journey for anything because of the people yeah. I met. You know what I mean? So I'm with you. I, I, I'm like that. You know, I, you know, I think that's a great story about what you told there. And you just have to, you know, cultivating what's important to you in life. You know, I think yeah. we've just overvalued it as money. It's not always money. It's right. waking up and doing things you enjoy doing. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a funny Seinfeld's one of my uh, favorite comedians. And uh, <laughs> there's a story that he tells the story where there's a, a band that breaks down on the side of the road in the in the winter and they go trudging through the snow and they see a light on with a family inside and a nice warm, warm by a fire. And they look inside, they go, how could anyone live like that? Right. Because, you know, they're, and, and, that, and that's they're both right. You know, the people yeah. inside near the fire, they're right. And the people who like trudging through the snow because they're going to the next gig, they're right too, you know? So your dad's right and you're right. You're both right. Right. It's just what you want to do, right? So uh, why don't walk us through the different businesses that you have right now. Sure. So uh, I have this not Nacho t-shirt on. You know, you name your company after an appetizer, you expect to get questions. So yeah. when I'm on the street, you know, I could just this, you know, when you're, I was walking down Broad Street, Philadelphia, I uh, lived here my, for the past two decades and I hear someone shout from behind me, hey, you, right? So when yeah. you're in Philadelphia, this happens, you got to be ready for er anything, right? Disgruntled, yep. eagle fan, tourist. And it was this 50-ish year old woman who looked at me and said, what is dental nachos, right? What is dental nachos? And I always have this line that I give because dentists get asked a lot of questions. So when anyone asks you a question, you don't know the answer. It's a weird question. I always say, that's a great question. A lot of people ask me that. It gives my brain a chance to think. I said, yep, it's a great yep. question. A lot of people ask me that. Dental nachos is a lot like a Mr. Rogers neighborhood for dentistry where we come together online and in person to learn how to be nice to each other, to learn how to care about each other. Dentists are great with their patients. They're not always great with each other. Dental mm -hmm. schools like the Dental Student Hunger Games, yep. there's tremendous toxicity. I have a four-year-old who lives in my house. You go to dental school for four years. If you told a child from age zero to four, you're not good enough, compete with your friends, you're not going to make it, this isn't right by older people, you would develop a real big personality problem, right. insecurity, low self-esteem. So it is a sad of the state of dental education. Uh, they do a great job with teaching technology, but not so great with teaching you how to be a professional and interact with each other. So dental not just serves as, you know, Philadelphia is known for its park, Steve. Like think of a giant free park like Rittenhouse Square where sure. people can talk, where people can meet each other. This is all online and in person, but we're well known for our 40,000 member online community. Wow. And the way this is funded is we have sponsors that sell things in this park if anyone liked the buy. So right. just like you have a sponsor for the podcast. So that's one of the ways Dental Nachos is able to do what it does. We have awesome sponsors, accountants, equipment companies, technology companies that pay. You know, everyone knows the, the, this story. Go to convention, walk around convention. People have stuff they're trying to sell you, right? right. You may want to buy coaching for your business. You may want to buy new floors for your dental office. I've kind of taken that experience of the Greater New York Dental Meeting and put it online. Got but it. in the true yeah. sense, right, when you're walking around the exhibit floor and you see a friend, you say, oh, you're my friend from dental school and let's chat. Well, I've made that an online experience for dentists. And it, when, when being someone who's out there online, you can get some arrows tossed at you, right? Yeah. But what, what inspires me is, you know, people send me messages like they just did recently. This makes me feel less alone. This makes me feel nice. like someone cares about me. So to me, Dental Notches is here to help dentists feel less alone, you know, learn together, laugh together. And this is my big one, be less annoyed together because it's yeah. very annoying to be a dentist. It is very annoying at times to be a dentist. It's interesting you say that. One of the reasons that we have a specialty area with dentists is because the um, it's, it's not easy to be one. 
And by the time yeah. people get, because our target, our primary audience is like 45 to 50 up to 70. Um, we actually have quite a few uh, dentists that are like retiring and they're 68 to 70. And so they have different reasons they want to do what we do than a 45 or 50 year old. But it's, it is, I mean, we've learned that from them. And I, I had a years ago when I was a corporate banker, I had a customer who built the largest dental floss, private label dental floss and toothbrush wow. company in America called Rainier Corporation and ended up selling it to Johnson and Johnson in the nineties. And doc, Dr. Najar was his name. And he um, told me back then, it was, this was like 91, 92, I was a young lender. And he said, you know that um, we have the highest suicide rates in our profession. And he kind of unpacked why, you know, it's just, I was shocked. It's just really hard to be a dentist. Yeah, it's, I mean, and, and all that's, you know, such a poignant part of our profession it doesn't have to be that way. Other mm-hmm. things we do is help dentists sell their dental practices. We help mm-hmm. dentists buy dental practices. Dentist Job Connect helps dentists connect for associates because sometimes mm-hmm. they need help. So those are all some of our paid services inside of there. Sure. Uh, I do a lot with um, continue education. You know, we have a platform where people can watch. 200 hours on their phone, you know, called mm-hmm. our Nacho On Demand C platform. So yeah. I also want, you know, my dream, Steve, is like some dentist is in their operatory is like a new dentist and their patient's like, you look young or I hate my work or why is this so expensive? And then they go to my app and it tells them what to say next. I'm really into work, <laughs> right? You know. So you're I, really in the business of solving problems for dentists and in providing them. Yeah. I would say there's plenty of dentists to help patients, and I still do that with implants, but I like to be the dentist to help the dentist because then they can go out, as Dennis, Dr. Dennis Tarno says, and help more patients. That's really cool. Yeah. Interesting. So what, what, what uh, motivated you to go beyond the chair to do all of that? I mean, I, I think that, you know, I, I like, I'm the type of person who likes change, likes diversity. Yep. Prior to all this online things, I was doing dentistry like three or four days a week. I was speaking on implants. I became a practice broker. I was running that Rising Dentist Study Club well before the Facebook world. So, you know, connecting with people and trying to mm-hmm. be someone that they could count on. But then I'm also really into, you know, one of my favorite companies is Canva. I don't know, Canva. Yeah, yeah. We Canva, you know, it's like $6 billion company. And that woman, I think, is just amazing. She, Her whole company is built on this freemium model, right? So I love the meritocracy. Like, I, Gary Vee's great. Like, I could not have built this company if there weren't free social media apps, right? For me right. to get this attention in the 80s, I'd have to buy commercials. I never right. would have afford that, as you said. So Canva's like, hey, here, use our Canva stuff to make a flyer for your, you know, kid's birthday or something like that. Use it as a growing company. But then once you need more from us, you got to start paying, right? right? Once you need more from us, you got to be a, a member. That's kind of how I do everything. Like I give so much free stuff yep. in, a, in an authentic way. Of course, I'll follow up with people and ask if they want something more or upgrade, but we have so much free stuff on how not to mess up buying a practice, how to talk to patients. But then for the people who want more, we have deeper, more significant products and services. And so I love the Canva founder, listener on how I built this more than once. I think that in this world of being able to scale services like yeah. e-courses or webinars, that there's just such a great opportunity to help people who wouldn't be able to get help right. and then see who wants to do more with you. Right. Uh, that's exciting. Tell us about the study clubs. I mean, the study clubs that we have, we have um, Super Bowl style events. We have one coming up. We're like 150 to 200 people to Philadelphia. We have two days of lectures. We have networking. It's fun. People okay. stay in hotels. That's kind of like our big in-person stuff, which we also still live stream. So I love the pay-per-view model where, hey, you can't come from Kansas to Philadelphia, but you still want to learn. We'll give it to you on pay-per-view. So yep. just like, you know, pay-per-view WWF wrestling from when I was a kid yep. or boxing. So, But then I also do things. I'm a big sitcom fan from the 80s, the Family Ties, the Cheers, the Wonder Years. So I also do these programs where I bring 20 dentists from around the country and put them in a small room mm-hmm. and we lecture to them all weekend. It's called a Super Dentist Boost Camp instead of Boot Camp, Boost Camp. Mm-hmm. And it's, we're able to feel the energy of lecturing and meeting people in a group, but not having to deal with 200 people at once, which is more like a wedding. So yeah. I do these study clubs, study clubs that are small, medium, and large in size to deliver the 
recipe for whatever success the dentist wants at that time. Maybe sure. it's high level crowns and veneers. Maybe it's buying a practice. You know, managing your team. I try really hard. I'm a big fan of menus. I like eating out at restaurants. And uh, I try to create a menu of options for people so that they can pick what helped them most. Well, that's interesting. Um, I uh, w- One of the questions I wanted to ask you with all of this that you have going on, I think it's fascinating because it is. It's like whether it's your the Job Connect or the Study Club or the dental nachos you're 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 creating this ecosystem of success for dentists um, yeah. and, and i think that's great vision so what what about the written how is it written house uh consulting well that is like that written house consulting kind of represents me that's more of an entrepreneurial we could talk about this that you know that was like my first foray into making something from your thoughts into a business Got so it. you know our yeah. written house consulting was a We've written house square in Philadelphia is one of my favorite places. So, you know, it was my way of, you know, I still do advice related coaching. You know, I don't know if you've been to the dentist. This is a good one for your listeners. This is what I do a lot of for people who want to buy or sell practices. Someone hasn't seen a dentist since the pandemic and they break their tooth and they call my office and they say, I'm a new patient. I need to get in. Right. They may need a root canal and crown, which might be like $3,000. They might need their tooth extracted and get an implant might be $5,000. They may just need a small filling, which is $300. But if they go right to the root canal person, they're going to talk about a root canal. They go right to the implant. They're going to talk about an implant person. They come to us as general dentists. And for an x-ray and exam for like $120, we evaluate their problem and then decide what's next. Okay. Limited or all exam and x-ray. I do that with Someone says, Paul, I might want to sell to a DSO, but I don't know if I want to sell to somebody else. I'm so confused. Should I talk to an accountant? I said, you really need a strategy person. You need like a general contractor for your house. You need a general dentist for your mouth. Come to me. I'll charge you a nominal fee. We'll go into a deep dive on this. Sure. And then I'll get you to the right place next. So that really is the written house consulting arm of the, I call it a dentist talk about treatment plans. I'm sure you guys have nutritional plans and health plans. Yeah. So I call it the treatment plan, your hopes and dreams with Dr. Nacho. We're going to sit down okay. and you're going to pay like less than 500 bucks, right? And you get these assets with it. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, what's interesting too, and I mean, maybe this adds value because I've gotten a reputation of, you know, you give too much out away for free, Paul, and everything you do is free and, you know, no one's going to value. I say, that's not really true. When people want my time, I don't give that away for free. Right, as much. right. Yeah, right. For yeah. two reasons. One, there's only one of you. You can't scale yourself. Right. And two, if if somebody has a big picture issue, right, buy a practice, sell a practice, add an associate, and they're not willing to invest a few hundred dollars into solving that problem, Right. They're not the right fit for me for raving fans because their mindset is not in the right place. Correct. And let me explain to your dental audience. I do a lot of dental implants. So when you do a dental implant, you take a special x-ray called a CBCT. It's a three-dimensional x-ray. Mm-hmm. You were my patient, Steve, and I said, hey, Steve, we can replace this. We'll remove this tooth, preserve the bone, replace it with an implant. It's going to be like a $5,000 investment. The first step, Steve, is this x-ray is $350. It goes towards the cost of your treatment and it lets us see how much bone you have. If you don't want to do that x-ray, you're never going to want to do the implant. You're not going to do the 5,000. Yeah. 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 Yep. That's really interesting. Tell us. That's my strategy for that. Yeah. Uh, Well, I think it's wise on, especially on your digital stuff to give a lot away free because that that's how you probably have gotten 40,000 dentists now that you can then, there's a certain percentage of them are going to kind of swim upstream and want to do want to learn yeah. more, and more with you. Right. So that makes total sense. So what was, talk to me about in the last five years, say like, when did you first start uh, uh, your dental practice in the early two thousands? I mean, I was lucky. My dad was a dentist with his partner. I, I came in, his partner had stayed for a few years. He had left. We brought my brother on. So that was like in the 2005 range. In Nine. 2010, we bought a second location. Yep. So then we had another practice. We've added specialists like periodontists. I mean, I think there's one thing that people will pay a lot for, okay? Yep. And it doesn't matter it, how much money you have. And that word is C word, convenience, okay? Yeah. They will pay, people will pay for convenience, yep. especially for services they don't want. So what I thought would be great is 
bring in the periodontist, bring in the endodontist, have them work with us in our location. So patients, when we say, oh, you would need a dental implant, you come back back here. So I've expanded our services by having other providers. Sure. There's no no disrespect to the traditional model. That still has a great, but like you send someone to a periodontist, then you go over here and the patient kind of gets exhausted by going to 15 different places. Okay. So mm-hmm. I brought more into our office. We still refer things out, but that's one of the things I've added to our practice model. That's so I think patients appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I've not heard a lot of that. So that's pretty cool. I mean, we do that. I mean, our, our whole model is virtual. I mean, they have to come to Seattle oh, cool. one time, and then the rest of the year is all at home. Yeah, doctors, That's great. coaches, everything. So, so I have a question for you. So, so you've got you know almost twenty years in business. Uh, yeah. What's been a big challenge you had to overcome, or a mistake that you made in in your years of business that really has been beneficial to you as now now in your best version of you today? E- it's the easiest answer: not getting, not paying for help on how to manage people early enough. Uh, no matter what you do. So in 2010, when we were going to expand, yep. I really, my dad and I, my dad was amazing. It was never, was a cheap guy, always wanted to invest in stuff, but we had somewhat of a battle over getting coaching for our team management. Cause I had an amazing person, Carol Kibler, I still know. And back in 2010, it was like, you know, I guess that's, I was a 32 year old. I said, dad, I want to invest $20,000 this year and how to manage the team. He goes, that's no good. Everybody leaves. We don't have to do that. But I knew for us to grow, we'd have to get the team on the same page. Yep. Yep. And then more importantly, we have to get the leaders on the same page. And I wish I did that sooner. In the world in the world of dentistry, I did a lot sooner than most dentists because they usually, I mean, I'm sure you deal with this. People usually, sometimes people, people wait until they can't get out of bed to yeah. try to go get help for the back, yeah. right? right? Ideally, you the first day when you're like, my back hurts. So I did it earlier than many dentists, but I still wish I'd done it sooner. And I wish that someone had told me as soon as possible because the tools you need to manage a team is the uh-huh. is either going to help you with your dream or make you scream if that's a, a rhyme, right? Because uh, or it's stop that it. is the toughest part. Yeah, yeah it'll stop it. I, I had to learn the same lesson. I had I was not too much different time than you. It was in the late two thousands. Uh, we'd done an acquisition from gone from two stores to nine. And I realized right then, like, I can't do everything anymore. I've got to get help. So I got some coaching on how to scale and build a high performing team. And that, that really was critical for us because we then we went to 850 employees after that. And um, I learned how to leverage through people, you know, so great lesson. Thanks for sharing. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, So who's an early mentor in your business career? I mean, an early mentor in my business career, uh, Dr. I. Stephen Brown, I just talked to recently, he was a, a periodontist, or he is a periodontist still. Uh-huh. And the, the fact that we don't teach people about money earlier in our society is a major problem. And the fact that dental schools talk about money is a real problem. Dental school charges $500,000, Steve. Doesn't teach us how to talk about money to patients. No problem taking all the money, right? Yeah, but right. when you make a topic weird, like money, People become awkward talking about. It. So even though I had a dad and his partner as mo- as mentors, they never really explained how they talked to patients about money, and they didn't have the greatest systems either. But sometimes things were just easier. So one of the best parts about my dad was he was very secure, and he would never say, "Well, I had it tough too. Don't complain." At the end of his life and career, we worked together for eleven years. He said, "Patients have always been tough. They don't want to open their mouth." That happened in the 1970s and the 2010s. Yep. Team members would cause you problems in the 1980s and in the 2000s. Yeah. They said running a dental practice has become so amazingly difficult and complex. He goes, it was when, first of all, there was no computers when he started. Right. They just wrote stuff in a paper yeah. notebook. So yeah. the business skills you needed to survive and thrive have gotten com- different. And my mentor, Dr. Stephen Brown, he sat down with his fancy boys in Brook Brothers suits, monogram <laughs> cuffs, yeah. and he said, you know, this is how you talk to patients. I said, ah, he's just this rich guy and all his patients are rich. I that this rich periodontist doesn't know what's going on. But then I met one of his patients who was doing a very expensive case and she had the very high paying job, Steve, a professional clown. So oh I said, God. maybe this guy, Stephen Brown, 
maybe he's able to do some amazing things. Maybe he's yeah. able to talk to people and share the value in an yeah. authentic and genuine way. And that was transformative to me. I just did I just did a podcast with my office manager today. I give every single patient that if someone said to me, Paul, you have one thing you can tell me as a dentist and you can never tell me anything again, this is what I would tell them. Give every single patient the chance to say no to the best treatment. Do not judge anyone. Give right. every single person yep. all the options. Give them, I'll just use a cliche thing, give them the Mercedes, the Volvo, and the Honda options. Don't look at someone and say they can't afford a Mercedes. Don't look with someone with a beaten up car and say they'll never take care of a Mercedes because I've changed people's lives on my own in the best way by not judging them in any way and just simply saying to them, here's A, B, and C. Here's what happens if you do nothing. Which one sounds best to you? And so many people, Paul, um, <clears throat> with something so personal as their smile, um, you can't judge that book by the cover because they'll find the money. You know, yeah. we, you know, we did when I was in the pet business, I used to tell my managers, don't sell out of your own pocket because uh, they would see people come yeah. in 24 years old, have a dog. They were working minimum wage job and they'd spend ninety dollars on origin dog food because that was really important to them. They want to take care yeah. of them. Right. Stop, get, watch this. stop trying. Stop trying to live in other people's minds. Life gets a lot more relaxing. Right. I mean, I don't care what people choose. I, I give them the menu. Someone goes, Paul, you're expensive. I don't want your implant. Okay. Someone has three kids in college and they want to finance it because they really want to smile well. Okay. Right. I mean, why? who am I to judge how people spend their money, right? I'm, right. I will say this. I, I feel good about what I put on my menu, yep. you know, fixed implant cases, removable, this. And then I just simply say, which one do you want to order at our house, of de at our restaurant of dentistry? Right, right, right. And they laugh, you know, um, you get to do some cool things. And then people tell you no, too. I mean, one of the things I think, Steve, that is really difficult. And if a pre-dental student um, was asking me, I'd say, what are the skills you need to be a dentist? Good at models? Nope. Right. Good at science? Nope. <laughs> Good at being rejected a lot with the thing you want to sell. Yeah. Good at being rejected a lot. Resilience. And just yeah. living. Yeah. Resilience and living for those few wins. Yep. Living yeah. for those few wins. Yeah. Where you can change somebody's life and it makes you feel great. Uh, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's great advice. So, if I if 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 you were to describe, uh, who's the ideal client for you in the dentist? Because it's it's a dentist, obviously, because you have this ecosystem of support for them that they can enter. What would you say is the profile of your ideal? Ideal. Dentist? I like that. I think it's a really good business question. And um, I have a lot of sponsors and every I don't judge how anyone runs their business. I might not sound I talk fast. I'm animated, but I'm actually a really patient person. So mm -hmm. for me, I'm going to use an example. If you were going to have a grocery store, would you want a 50 year old couple that makes three hundred thousand dollars a year to shop at your at your grocery store? Or would you want a 29-year-old at their first job who's going to live in the area for the next 20 years? Then we'll use that 50-year-old couple as a family. That 50-year-old couple obviously is going to spend a lot more now feeding their right. family. Yep. But your 29-year-old, if you can get them to understand how you sell food and why it's important, they're going to be your customer for life. So in my world, it's a dentist that's about to buy their first dental practice. Got and it. we help everyone. We help dental students. We help you know, sometimes people throw those stale nachos at me, Steve, and people send me messages. 62 year old dentist says, Paul, keep doing what you're doing. I wish I had you when I was younger. I'd be happier. I wish there was a dental nachos when I was younger. These people who are threatened by what you do, they just, it's because they get easily, you know, I mean, here's the thing. I'm not a vegetarian at all, right? But at times my wife has been way more into ordering, uh, buying less meat, right? Yeah, sure. If I sit down at a restaurant and I say, oh, hey, I'm not eating as much meat. Someone who gets threatened goes, well, meat's not bad for you. I didn't say it was bad for you. I just said, yeah. I'm not eating as much meat, right? right, right. So sometimes if I say, you know, working as a solo dentist is a recipe for a lot of stress and maybe look for a partner, someone will shout, but I'm a solo dentist and I'm not stressed. I go, well, the way you're shouting kind of sounds like you're stressed. <laughs> but, I, but for me, the ideal profile of who I think I could have the most impact on, I think the bet, I, ROI, Steve, is very important to me. And yep. ROI to me is relationships, opportunities, and impact, not how we think. Um, like it's yep. the, 
the dentist about to buy their first dental practice. Yeah, because you can go on a long journey with them. I love that. And I think it's, I'll actually kind of, I kind of guess your world. I don't know if I know it as well. It's because I can give them fundamental changes for them to be healthier long term yep. instead of trying to fix an unhealthy situation, right? Later. So it's right. it's a journey together, but it's also a little bit of the blank slate stuff yep. where I, I love helping everyone. I need to help myself with stuff, right? But when you have someone, when they're early in a journey, you can kind of put in fundamentals, right? You know, basketball, like fundamentals of dribbling right. and shooting yeah. that they can use forever. And I think that's more fun. You know, it's real interesting just because of where you're from. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He was one of our early clients. Um, he coached at Villanova and at Penn State, Patrick Chambers. Uh, oh, wow. Cool. I yeah, don't know if I know that. Yeah, he's a Philly guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I learned quite a bit about the Philly basketball culture from him, which is tremendous. Yeah, I, I mean, I love basketball. I think ba entrepreneurship is a lot like basketball, especially dentistry. You're not going to make all the shots. You're going to turn the ball over. Your teammates right. going to throw a bad – got to keep playing. Got to keep That's playing. Right. And you're up and down all the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> dental, school, I, dental school teaches you like this, Steve. I don't know. It's time left. You, this no, is how they go teach for it. Go. go for it. They go, you missed a shot. We're going to stop the game and we're going to analyze why you missed this shot for the <laughs> next three hours. And I go, but what about the game? Right. So while you need to learn from drop passes, you need to develop a strategy to dribble, pass, shoot, and play the game. And right. many of these professional schools, are just not delivering on that. And then if you get into an environment where you don't have a mentor or someone to help you, it can be really, really difficult for a new dentist. Yeah, boy, it sounds like it. And that's what your ecosystem is about, is about helping them through that and providing yeah. more practical education. That's that's brilliant. Real quick, I like to ask this of everybody. Do you have any daily rituals you do that you think make you successful? And Because you're doing a lot. Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I mean, one of my quotes that I say is everything that matters needs a system and everything matters, plus make the best decision in the moment. Uh, I, my, a lot of my, my, one of my biggest daily rituals as a 40, almost 45 year old is walking. Yep. I really commit. I have to actually hear me. I, I get, well, it's, I just, I, just, I don't know if it's plugged in. I actually have a walking treadmill underneath here. Gary Bird, SMC National has one. So really getting enough steps to stay active is incredibly important i think for both my mind and my physical fitness so it might not be so dramatic if i wake up at 5 a.m and, and write in a journal i do do this every day okay i wake up and have coffee every day i love coffee right coffee is a big part of my life um but, uh, just walk so i would actually say steps to success are i feel more energetic so i've been in times in my life where i've been incredibly fit yeah. And I've done all kinds of working out and that does not fit into my life situation now. I still right. do use the gym, but I've have to understand, you know, I actually, there's this high level coach. I wish you get the podcast. It was on David Mullally's podcast. He was great. The thriving dentist, I think. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm a high level coach and I have a really hard time explaining to CEOs and executives that it's okay if you don't work out six days a week, right. two's better than none. I had a big problem with that. I have a big problem with if I can't have the whole bag of M&Ms, I'm not right. going to have any. If I can't work out for five days, I might as well not work out at all. And mm -hmm. it's taken me over the past decade to be like, don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, figure out what your fitness looks like for you. So taking, I average over 10,000 steps a day, no matter what. That's excellent. You know, one of our, we have eight health habits that every one of our clients builds into their life over that eight, over that year. And one of them is daily movement. And our we have all the data, the research supporting it. If all it is is 20 to 22 minutes a day of walking briskly, yeah. good enough. And you know what? Everybody can do that. And, if, and if, if you don't work out at all, but you do that, you're healthier than the person that does neither. And, and, and I also, I love that. Which, and I also think that I probably did maybe what was called I don't know what time, like over exercising, where sometimes yeah, I probably right. do it. So, see, I wish we'd done it before. I would know all the time. I have this walking treadmill. It's great. I can walk. Yeah. I, that's how I get my steps in. That's so. Awesome. If you ever want to text me for your clients, it's like nine hundred bucks, and it's changed my life in the best way. Because when I'm on Zooms with my team, I just walk. Just when I'm walk. doing some right. emails, I walk. It's just a walking desk I have here. Well, we've been talking to Dr. Paul Goodman um, from Dental Nachos among other companies on the Tiger Performance Podcast. 
Dr. Goodman, where uh, can people find you? Uh, I really am proud of our website. So dentalnachos.com is really a great place to see all the things that we do. But I, I also am um, a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk and I joined uh, what he does with his text community. So if people would like to text the word nachos to 215-543-6454. It's nachos to 215-543-6454. They'll get a totally free resource and they'll be in my text community to get what I think are funny jokes, inspiration stuff daily. So those are the two ways. That's awesome. And our uh, production guys are phenomenal. That'll all be in the show notes. And, yep. And so uh, this all format goes into our YouTube channel. It goes on our website and then it goes into a blog. So awesome. Um, yep. When all that comes out, we'll make sure to get it to you. And thank you for being on the podcast, Dr. Gooden. Oh, my pleasure. Really great talking to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to the Tiger Performance Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get the future episodes.